Jesus' will that our joy may be full, that his joy would remain in us. But he says, these things I have spoken to you. What, what was he teaching the disciples? What did he just share in John chapter 15? Well, he said things like, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears what? Much fruit. For without me you can do a couple things. Two things. Nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you abide in me, if you dwell in me, if you remain in me, you will produce much fruit. Joy is the byproduct of planting ourselves firmly in the finished work of the cross and growing in our understanding of who we are in Christ. Joy comes from walking in that new identity because we are confident of what the gospel has accomplished in us. Paul never sought out joy, but it always seemed to find him. He never went looking for it. But here he is in prison, in chains, in shackles. Yet the joy of the Lord has not left him. We are creatures of comfort, aren't we? Our joy rises and falls with how comfortable we are. And if someone takes our comfort away, we gripe and we complain and we moan and we groan and we whine. Because we're not planted in him. We're planted in ourselves. We're thinking about ourselves. Paul never sought out joy, but it always seemed to find him. See, and I know all of you, you've been in the church long enough. You've heard the analogy that you never see a fruit tree striving to produce fruit. You never see a branch just doing its best to, to will a fruit into being. It's simply a natural result of being firmly planted in rich soil, receiving water, receiving sunlight. And the longer that tree stays in those conditions, the more it matures, the more it grows, the more fruit it bears, and the more and that analogy carries through to us. The more we remain, the more faithfully we remain in Christ, the more fruit we, we produce. We become more spiritually mature. And again, the byproduct is true lasting joy. It's important because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Too many weak Christians today. And that leads us into chapter 1 of Philippians. So look at verse 1, chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you, all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Paul had a very unique connection with this church in Philippi. As parents, we're not supposed to have favorites. And I, I don't think that I would necessarily say the church in Philippi was Paul's favorite. But he doesn't speak of the, any of the other churches in the way that he speaks of the church in, in Philippi. In all his other letters to the various churches in Asia Minor, he was either condemning bad behavior, he was rebuking false teaching, or he was correcting misguided theologies. We've been through those letters, haven't we? 
His tone with them is the tone of correction. It doesn't change his love for them, but because of their behavior, because they weren't walking in the truth of the gospel, they weren't reflecting Christ, they had left their first love and they were pursuing the things of the world again, it changed his relationship with them. It's like us as children. We, we really set the tone for our relationship with our parents. I reduced my parents to drill sergeants. Because they said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I said, as for me and me, I'm going to do what I want. And because of that, our relationship was, was strained, to say the least. Could have our relationship been much different if we were on the same page? Absolutely. That's how Paul relates to the churches. He loves the churches deeply, but because of his love, he can't stand back and watch them destroy themselves. So his tone is very different than his tone with the church in Philippi. He writes things like, When I remember you, I thank God for you. When I pray for you, it gives me joy just thinking of you. I watched firsthand as God started a work in you, and I know I'm confident he will finish that work. I treasure you all in my heart, and I long to be with you. I yearn to be with you. I yearn for your company. See, in this day and age, there was a a stoic philosophy, if you will, where you didn't want to show your emotions. But Paul says, it's okay for me to say this. I yearn to be with you. Paul loved the believers in Corinth. He loved the believers in Galatia. He loved, loved the believers in Rome. But his relationship with them was obviously different. And really, that main difference we see in verse 5. Here's what brought Paul so close to the church in Philippi. He says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, fellowship for us means something a little bit different than it did in Paul's time. For us, fellowship is going out for a cup of coffee with another believer. Or fellowship is staying after the service for five more minutes to talk instead of just jamming out the back door and and heading out. Or fellowship is meeting friends for dinner that are also like-minded Christians and simply hanging out. But that's not necessarily what the term fellowship meant in Paul's time. See, in Paul's time, it was a term used in business. It was a business partnership. A fellowship was a joint business venture. So if you had Jonathan and Jebediah, they came together and they said, hey, I got a little money, you got a little money, let's put it together, let's start a fishing company. They would go into a a business fellowship together with the sole goal of making money for their, their company. That was a fellowship. All you nerds out there, when they got the the hobbits and the elves and the men and the the dwarfs, things. They got them together and they said, take this ring to Mordor. It was called what? The Fellowship of the Ring. You big nerd. It's not simply hanging out. It's brothers and sisters coming together under a common cause. And what was that common cause that Paul had with the believers in Philippi? The gospel. Seeing men and women come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. They were on the same page. They were one in mind. Paul wasn't in the business of selling Jesus, but he uses this term here to describe their like mind, their shared priorities, their singular aim of making the hope of the gospel known to the world. They had common goals. See, this centrality of the gospel is what brought Paul and the Philippians so closely together in fellowship. The gospel was their primary shared interest. And because of this, Paul could relate to them. He could connect with them because they were of the same mind, because they were both spiritually mature. The nature of my relationship with my oldest son, Luke, has changed tremendously over the years. He's 10 years old now. And the reason it's changed is because he's growing up. 
He understands deeper things now. We can have deeper conversations. And he was adorable as a little baby. And as much as I wanted him to stay in that form, if he did, something would tragically be wrong. And our relationship wouldn't be the same as it is now. We are meant to grow. We are meant to mature. Paul didn't have the same relationship with the other churches because they weren't growing up. He couldn't relate to them. His chief aim was to see Jesus glorified, but in many cases their chief aim was to glorify themselves. What does he write to the church in Corinth? In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3, I'll just read it to you. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Not that kind of babes, but babies, little babies. As to babies in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal in behaving like mere men? You're not acting like the new man that you are. You're still walking in that old nature. And because of that, we're not on the same page. And I'm left to simply correct and exhort and persuade instead of us being like-minded and working together for the furtherance of the kingdom of God, I'm stuck talking to you like children. He says, grow up. This isn't your new identity. This isn't who you've been made to be in Christ. So to understand this, that's Paul's mindset as he writes to the Philippians. They are of one mind, with one goal and one aim, to see Jesus Christ glorified. Look at verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge and all discernment, and in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So because of the maturity of the Philippian believers, Paul's letter to the Philippians is going to give us a unique perspective compared to his other letters. We are going to see what the, the we are going to see firsthand the impact that mature believers have on their culture. We are going to see the impact of men and women who understand and are constantly growing in their new identity in Christ, the impact that they can have on the culture around them. We can't read this book and say, oh, I need to be like that. I need to do that. Because everything we see in Philippians is the result of them abiding in Christ, taking it upon themselves personally to cultivate a very real and meaningful relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus has already made the way for that. He has already cleared the path. He has already torn the veil between us and God. The work is finished. And God simply says, if you seek me, you will find me, if you seek me with your whole heart. The Philippians were seekers. And so we are going to see the results of their maturity, the result of them being planted firmly by streams of living water, them bearing fruit in and out of season, their leaves never withering, and whatever they're doing, they're prospering in it because they're planted in Christ. See, and don't get me wrong here, because a lot of times we hear maturity and we instantly think morality. Don't look, don't taste, don't touch. A list of rules. I'm more mature than you because I don't have a TV at my house. Or I'm more mature than you because I don't listen to secular music. I'm more mature than you because I don't, 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 don't. That's not necessarily morality at all. Or maturity at all. Maturity is not simply morality. Maturity is measured by the centrality of the gospel in our lives and our dependence on it. 
A lot of times morality is simply self-righteousness. True maturity is knowing that we are dependent on Christ and remaining dependent on him. Your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Are we righteous? You've got to think about that for a second. In the flesh, no. Before we came to know Christ, no. But yes, we are. But it's not our righteousness. Our righteousness comes from Christ. He has imparted his righteousness to us. So the fruits of righteousness are the fruit of his righteousness given to us. It's not our own, it's his. To the glory and praise of God. Look at verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. See, as Paul was in chains, many of his enemies, many of the people that sought to tear his ministry down, said, look, God's not on his side. He's in chains. He's, he, he's in prison. If God was on his side, he would not be bound up. Chains were seen as a thing of shame. And Paul says, no, 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 no. What has happened to me has furthered the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. My chains are not a thing of shame. They are the sovereignty of God being played, being played out in my life. And because of that, the gospel is being furthered. So let's look real quick with the time we have remaining on the effect a mature believer has on their culture through the lens of Paul and through the lens of Philippians. Again, these are not things that we necessarily strive for, but these are the things that we can look forward to as we plant ourselves in the finished work of the cross. As we grow in our knowledge and understanding of what Christ has accomplished for each and every one of us. As we grow in our understanding that we are truly a new creation with changed desires, changed perspectives, and a new love for those who are lost. And we have to start with this because it is the most important effect a mature believer has on their culture. And it's right here in verse 12 and 13. What is it? The primary effect, the most important, most important, the reason we're here this morning, salvation. Salvation, redemption, reconciliation. When a man or a woman is surrendered to the Spirit of God, growing in his knowledge and understanding of what Christ has done for them, Maturing, God will use them to bring others to Christ. Isn't that worth it alone? Can't we stop there and say, yes, I want this joy. I want this fruit. I want to see men and women come to know Christ. I want to see legacies changed. That's the effect a mature believer has on their culture. It's one of the reasons Paul found joy in his various trials because he knew that Christ would be glorified and people around him would get saved. That's why he rejoiced in all suffering. And he was seeing this happen in Rome. That guard that he speaks of, that Roman guard, that's more than 9,000 men. Now, did 9,000 men come face to face with Paul during his imprisonment? Probably not. But it meant that the story of Paul and ultimately the story of Christ spread through the palace guard. Because you couldn't sit down and talk with Paul without being moved. Here was, here was a man completely sold out to his cause. Here was a man completely surrendered and committed to the cause of Christ. And he would not relent even at the opportunity of freedom. Here's a man suffering for his cause. 9,000 men heard about Christ. 
men were getting saved. Now again, Paul was not a stranger to incarceration. In fact, in his first missionary journey going through Philippi, he was arrested and sent to prison. So here he is writing to a church in Philippi where he also did time. In Acts 16, we're blessed with the beginnings of the church in Philippi. You can open there if you'd like. I'm going to just kind of sum up a few things here. But in Acts 16, we see the very beginnings of this church in Philippi. We see the very first converts in Philippi. See, Paul and Timothy, they were traveling through, or Paul and Silas, uh, rather, they were traveling through Philippi under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And they met a group of women by a river who gathered there regularly for prayer. More than likely praying to the God of the Jews. Kind of a unique situation for them. Kind of a Bible study, if you will, of women meeting and praying to the God of the Jews. And there was a a woman there named Lydia who was a wealthy business owner. If you recall, she sold the rare dye purple and probably sold purple clothing as well. So she was very rich. A woman by the world's standards who had need of nothing. She had both riches and she had spiritual enlightenment. But she didn't have Jesus. So Paul reasoned with her. And in verse 14 we read, The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized... She begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. I don't think it took much persuading, considering the home that Lydia probably had. So Paul meets with this woman who has religion. He shares with her Christ, and now she has a relationship with the one true God. And because of that, she invites Paul and Silas into her home. And Paul enjoys the lap of luxury for a little while because of this new convert. Lydia, the first convert in Philippi. The next individual they meet is very different from Lydia. It's a demon-possessed slave girl. She was probably 8 to 10 years old because Paul refers to her as a girl. And when he uses that phraseology, it means she wasn't marrying age. And they married them off young back then. So she was probably between 8 and 10 years old. Picture that for a second. Because we read Acts 16 and we miss the tragedy of the situation. This is an 8 to 10 year old little girl who is being used and exploited by men. She brings them their daily salary because she's demon-possessed and has some type of twisted supernatural power where she can tell people's fortunes. What a sick and demented situation we find her in. Well, this little girl, demon-possessed, she begins to follow around Paul, screaming at the top of her lungs, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Over and over and over again. Right message, wrong messenger. And finally, after a few days, Paul turns around and in a dramatic display of God's power and authority, he turns to the girl and says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, casting the demon out of her and changing her life forever. Man, imagine being part of something like this. Being involved in Rescuing girls from sex trafficking. Or simply having a backyard Bible study. My mom was saved from an alcoholic home, an alcoholic father, an alcoholic mother. Her legacy was meant for destruction, ultimately. But some woman was having a backyard Bible study, and I'd love to meet that woman. And she gave her life to Christ. And then began walking with her older sister, to church every Sunday. There's joy in that, being a part of that work. 
going over to the Good News Club at Akatio and having 90% of those kids never hearing the gospel. They don't know the story of Jesus. From what I heard when they shared with them the Christmas story, they were just locked in because they had never heard it in its entirety before. That's good stuff. You wonder why Paul had joy regardless of his circumstance? Because he was seeing God work, and there's nothing in this life that can compare to that. Changing legacies, changing stories, seeing men and women brought from the clutches of death and given new life and eternity with God. Paul watched this happen day after day after day, and it wasn't because he was a great teacher or he was charismatic or he was good-looking. It was simply because he was humbly surrendered to the will of God. And after he cast this demon out of this little girl, this upset her masters, because there goes their monthly income. And eventually... He gets thrown in prison for it. So he goes from Lydia's mansion to prison, all for the same work. we got to be prepared for that. Sometimes when we share the gospel, it's going to, our circumstances are going to change, and for whatever reason, we're going to be blessed by it. Maybe people will give gifts, people will pat us on the back, we'll be appreciated. Don't get addicted to that. Because there's going to be times where it's thankless. And you'll be torn apart by the very people that you are laying down your life for. They'll talk about you behind your back. They'll condemn you. They'll say things like, you think you're better than me? We need to be in it for the long haul, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of what we think to be the fruit. Paul never wavered in his singular focus on the gospel being proclaimed. So what did he do in prison? How's that story go? He gets thrown in jail and he's like, man, God, what are you doing? I was sharing the gospel like you told me to, and now I'm in prison. This stinks. Kicking rocks, sitting in the corner, whining. No, what was he doing? He was singing. He was praising God. And it's interesting because we read in Acts 16, 23, and when they had laid many stripes on them, see, they beat Paul first. They beat Paul and his companions first for changing this girl's life forever, kind of backwards thinking, and that's the world we live in. It's a little upside down. But Paul is beaten for casting out this demon, and they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Here's this jailer, and all he's told is to keep them safe. And you know what he does? Look at verse 24. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison, and he fastened their feet in the stocks. And when you hear the word stocks, you think of like medieval stocks. You stick your head in, you have your hands in it, they lock it, and you're in like the center of town. And people come and throw tomatoes at you or whatever they did back then. But the stocks in Rome were a torture device. So this jailer did his job, and he did it well, and he did it a little too well. So he's told to keep Paul safe, and he's like, okay, I'll keep him safe, and I'll torture him. But Paul's still singing praises with his companions. And here's this jailer who's probably a former GI, a former soldier. He's kind of a blue-collar, middle-class kind of guy, I believe. And he's just doing his job. He's probably looking forward to going home after his shift and spending time with his family. He has no idea what's about to happen next. Because as Paul and his companions were praying and singing hymns to God, and all the prisoners were listening to them, there was a great earthquake. And the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains fell off. It's kind of how the gospel works. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open. So let me ask you this. Did the earthquake awaken him? We, we don't know. I, I think this is important here. He awakens from his sleep 
and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. I personally don't believe that the earthquake and the rumbling of the prison has anything to do with this man's conversion. He saw the doors wide open. His identity was found in his job. He knew that losing prisoners meant losing his life. So he was going to take his life before his commanding captain could take it from him. His identity, his life, was literally wrapped up in his profession. And men, isn't that the case for us? The two questions we ask one another when we first meet. What's your name? What do you do? Because we tie those things together. And here's this man who essentially thinks he's lost everything. So he's going to take his own life. We saw that during the Great Recession, didn't we? Men involved in banking, after the collapse, they would kill themselves. Or they would kill their entire families and then kill themselves. Story after story after story of men who had everything tied up in their jobs. And once that job was gone... Their life was over. So here's this blue-collar guy ready to take his life. But the prisoners aren't gone. They stayed. And in Acts 16, verse 28, But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all still here. Then he called for a light, and he ran in, and he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who all were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. He cared for them, and immediately all he and his family were baptized. It wasn't the earthquake. It wasn't the miracle It was the fact that here's this man who could have fled. He had his freedom. He could have been long gone, but he stayed. And because of that, he saved my life. What's going on with this man? What is this thing that he has spoken of? I'm ready to listen now. See, real life, everyday evangelism. That's what was taking place here. But look, look at these three stories. How radically different are all three of them? But we build churches on just one of them. Oh, you can only save someone through careful theology. You can only save someone if you sit down and you reason with them. Not Again, that has a huge place in sharing the gospel. We need to know the fullness of the gospel. We can't throw out some funky idea about how to get saved and think, okay, God will take care of the rest. We need to be grounded in truth. But sometimes he does something radical. Paul casted out the demon from this girl. And my hope is that she came to saving faith in Christ. And then here's this jailer that sees Paul living in a way that's completely different than the world. Anyone who was of the world would have ran when those gates were open. But Paul did something completely different. And he said, what's going on in your life? How how must, you've been talking about my need to be saved. Because I've been stuck down here with you for who who knows how long, I'm ready to listen now. Has that ever happened to you? You've been sharing the gospel with someone and they're just not ready to hear it and something happens in their life that brings them face to face with their own mortality. And they say, now tell me, what must I do to be saved? God works in mysterious ways. I just made that up. You can use it if you want So there's the early beginnings of the church in Philippi. Different people from different walks of life, saved in very different ways, but all through Paul's personal devotion to Jesus. See, as we grow in our understanding of Jesus, as we grow in his love for us, through our careful study of his word, through our fellowship and and prayer, as we plan ourselves in his finished work, And as we learn to say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit, guys, we're going to see people get saved. And it's not because of us, but it's because of the Lord working through us and we're allowing him to do that work. And that should be enough. We should be able to stop there. But there's more and more benefits. We have time for one more. Look at verse 14. And most of the brethren 
in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So evidence one, effect one, result one of being mature, planted in Christ, learned, growing in our understanding of our new identity is men and women getting saved. Number two, what do we see there? Most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. A mature Christian inspires boldness in other believers. But there's a deeper spiritual lesson here. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10, we read, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. What's Paul saying there to the church in Corinth? That a mature Christian inspires other Christians to be mature. I know it's rocket science. But a mature Christian inspires other Christians to be mature. It's contagious. See, as we walk in the Spirit, and as we exercise our gifts with excellence, because God doesn't give cheap gifts, and each one of us is new, uniquely gifted, as we experience the joy of the Lord... Other believers will desire that very thing in their own lives. So I want to ask a question. This is really important. Does the way you and I serve the Lord inspire others to do the same? Whether it's here at church, whether it's home with the family, whether it's at work. Does the way we go about serving the Lord inspire others to do the same or does it discourage them? Because I guarantee if you do what you do without joy, nobody will want to be a part of it. See, we know the harvest is plentiful and the, the laborers will always be few. But it doesn't say the laborers are none, right? There will always be a few. And are we inspiring that few to come and join us? See, Pastor Chuck inspired men to go out and teach the word of God. And when... Someone asked him, what is it about the way you go about your business? Over 400 Calvaries in the United States, over 1,000 worldwide. What is it about the way you serve God that inspires other men? And his response is, they figured if I could do it, anyone can. And that's, that should be true about whatever we do. If we're leading worship... Are there people lining up to be a part of what we're doing? If we're leading in the children's ministry, if we're setting up tables and chairs, whatever we do in the Lord is what we're doing replicating. And if it's not, I know we can fall back on, well, the workers are few, but let's not use that as a cop-out when it, in reality, there's no joy in what we do. And we're simply pushing people away because the reality is what we do here should be a blast. It should be awesome. Friends coming together to see men and women and children come to know Christ. There should be a ton of joy, but a lot of times it becomes a routine. It becomes a chore. It becomes a task. Something that we don't look forward to, and it was never meant to be that. Has your excitement for being involved in ministry dwindled to nothing and now it's a chore? The reason it's gone is because your joy is gone and the reason your joy is gone is because you're no longer planted in Christ. You're planted in yourself. You're planted in the world. Guys, it's easy to get there. I've been there. It's a constant struggle. But this work is too fantastic to do it as if it was a chore. As if it was boring. As if it was simply a hoop to jump through. This is a privilege. Are we encouraging young men and women to come alongside us and eventually take our place? Or are we discouraging them from it? You know how we discourage young men and women? We demonstrate to them that what we're doing stinks. 
and we do it with our kids, and we don't even know it, man, I got to go in early for prayer. Oh, man, I, I'm scheduled for the twos and threes. What did I do wrong to get the twos and threes? Erin, you didn't do anything wrong. No, she's never said that. She's never said that. But again, guys, we can't say, okay, I need to go and be more joyful. That's what I need. No, you need Jesus. And I, I know that sounds cliche, but you need, we need, I need to continue to find myself planted in Christ because it's his righteousness, it's his spirit that lives in me. And I am so dependent on him. I can't bear fruit alone. But in him I can bear much fruit. If we can't seem to attract anyone to come alongside us, because Paul had Timothy and Silas and his companions, and they weren't forced to come along with him, but I guarantee these men were jumping at the chance to serve alongside Saul or Paul. May it be the same way with us. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Joy is the serious business of heaven because it can only be found when we are found in Christ. It's not the cause, it's the effect. The effect of fixing our eyes on Jesus. And before we take communion, I'll close with this verse. If you'll open with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord with nothing to offer, nothing to give, only thing to trade is yourself. As you received him, also walking in it with nothing to give, nothing to offer, but yourself. Rooted and built up in him and established in faith.